Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich, and I am very happy to welcome back to this radio program Naomi Oreskes. Naomi Oreskes is a historian of science at Harvard University. She's well known for her work on explaining climate change. Her book in 2010, Merchants of Doubt, showed that the fossil fuel industry was using a similar playbook that big tobacco used in denying the deleterious effects of their products. That book was turned into a major film. It's also a world-renowned geologist, and her latest book is called Science on a Mission, American Oceanography from the Cold War to Climate Change, a chronicles of the U.S. military-funded scientific projects and understanding the ocean and how that funding determined what we know and what we don't know about the seas. She joins me over Zoom, Naomi Oreskes. Again, it is a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Let's just begin with some of your thoughts about the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, Scotland. It, it's now over. They've, I, I guess, in a broad sense, determined to they're going to return next year with more ambitious uh, goals to try to cl- uh, cut the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. What's your reaction to what happened this past weekend? Well, I think most of us didn't have really high hopes. We knew the odds of a really strong agreement were probably slim. But I have to say it is pretty disappointing, especially the way we saw the power of the fossil fuel interests really uh, come to bear, especially in the final days of the conference where certain key things were weakened because of lobbying from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, We know there were more delegates from the fossil fuel industry than from any country. If they had been a country, they would have been the biggest country there. So there's a really fundamental problem about the power that the industry exerts. Uh, It's about the power of money, and that's a segue into my book, which is about the influence of money on science. Well, it it seems like most people now are accepting that climate change is real and that humans are playing an important role in climate change. Is is climate change denialism still relevant? It sure is, because it's taking new forms. And there's a lot of what I would now soft denial. So one of the forms of soft denial that we've seen a lot of in the last couple of months in the run-up to COP is the industry trying to reposition itself as a trustworthy partner in addressing this problem. We've seen a lot of talk about carbon storage technologies. The infrastructure bill that was just passed has more money for carbon management than it does for renewable energy. And the big lie there is that carbon management consists of managing the carbon that's produced in the production of fossil fuels, that is in the service of more fossil fuels. So carbon management, uh, it can in some cases make fossil fuel production not quite as terrible as it would otherwise be, but it is not a climate solution. And yet the fossil fuel industry is talking about it as if it is. And I have already seen signs that people are being snookered by this. Including in the infrastructure measure. Now, we know and we've been told the major climate change provisions are in this other bill, um, the Build Back Better Act, uh, but that there were also some climate change aspects to the infrastructure measure. Are, are you are you saying that it's not that that's not entirely true? Well, we have to wait and see what happens in the next bill. But this massive amount of money, uh, billions and billions of dollars for carbon management, in my opinion, is just essentially another subsidy to the fossil fuel industry. We know that the defenders of fossil fuels often like to talk about the free market and the power of free enterprise. But this is not a free market. This is a massively subsidized industry. The International Monetary Fund estimates that fossil fuels are the second most subsidized industry in the world. The only thing more subsidized is agriculture, Uh, $650 billion every year in direct subsidies and trillions in indirect subsidies. And this is yet another subsidy to an industry that is making huge profits selling fossil fuels and sticking us, the U.S. taxpayer, with the bill. How about the bill back better plan? Do do you feel like that? Well, well, we don't know exactly what's going to be in that. There's been a lot of promises that there'll be more money for renewable energy uh, and for grid improvement. You know, we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. We know that the fossil fuel industry is aggressively lobbying uh, to sustain their business model, which means more fossil fuels. Congressional hearings a couple of weeks ago, every American fossil fuel company said they were planning to expand production. So the idea that there's meaningfully involved in climate solutions is simply not true. So they're, they're still using a playbook. Has the playbook changed? Well, the playbook's changed in the sense that the sort of gross misrepresentation of the science have have been reduced. So we don't see the kind of out- 
appalling claims that make scientists head explode. Uh, we, they've moved past that, but we're still seeing a lot of misrepresentations misrepresentations about their own commitment to renewable energy or green energy solutions. Uh, there was a publicity a couple of weeks ago about a study that looked at Chevron's advertisements. We've seen huge ramping up of advertisements, particularly on social media, uh, which emphasize Chevron and ExxonMobil and other oil companies' green energy activities. Now, it is true they do have some, but uh, the study showed that something like 80% of Chevron's ads were about green energy or clean energy solutions, but only 2% of their operating budget is actually going for that. So this is a giant disconnect between how they're presenting themselves and what they're actually doing. And what they're actually doing is continuing to explore for more oil and gas. Exploring for more. More, right. Not just developing what they have, but continuing to look for more, which means committing us to a future of at least another 50, if not 100 years of fossil fuel dependency. Uh, and that's completely incompatible with the goal of keeping climate change below two degrees, much less 1.5. So while they may say in public, and they do say that they accept the Paris agreements, their actions are completely incompatible with that. Is this because if they end up finding this oil, it's going to be very hard to stop production of it? Well, I mean, it's always hard to stop production of a profitable activity, right? It's been these hard companies, so far. Yeah. Right. These companies are massively profitable. And, you know, in a way, I don't blame them. I mean, if I had a company that made billions of dollars every year, and if I were a CEO making $20 million every year, that's a pretty nice situation for me. Uh, but it's a really bad situation for the rest of the world. And so we see these companies not just dragging their feet on change, but actually refusing to change and then misrepresent, misrepresenting their positions to the American people and to Congress. Yeah. As you were talking, I, I do remember seeing almost every, and you're talking about Chevron. I, I suspect it's other companies too, because it seems like every time I see an, uh, a commercial sponsored by a, a, a company from the fossil fuel industry, it's always talking about climate change now and how Yeah. How I mean, if you, if you didn't know better, you would think that these were green energy companies, right? You would think that, you know, al algae biofuels was their main business operation, which it's not. In the case of ExxonMobil, studies have shown that less than 0.16% of their total operating budget is going for biofuel, algae biofuels and green energy solutions. So it's a gross misrepresentation of their business activities. And we also know in the case of Exxon, when the shareholders have tried to push them into a more climate friendly position, they have fought that tooth and nail. They have fought their own shareholders, the people who, at least in theory, are the owners of the company. Now, your book, Science on a Mission, chronicles how the U.S. military funding, especially for the Navy, would determine what we know and what we don't know uh, about the oceans. And we're going to dive into that. But are are we seeing a similar dynamic play out with with climate and who who sponsors and who pays for the studies determines some of what's being put out there now? Do we have, a, I guess, a struggle between uh, competing research comp depending on who who funds them? I think so. I mean, one of the problems we have is that the fossil fuel industry is enormously wealthy and environmental groups and ordinary citizens are not. And so one thing we've seen in the last 10 years is that a tremendous number of environmental programs uh, in universities across the country are now heavily funded by the fossil fuel industry. At Dartmouth College a couple of years ago, they started a new center for the environment, and it is the Irving Center for the Environment, that is to say the Irving Oil Company, Canadian-based oil company. So we've seen huge amounts of money flowing into universities. And it's not all bad. I mean, I'm not saying that the research they do is necessarily wrong, but it really skews the playing field in the direction of the kinds of approaches and solutions that the fossil fuel industry would like to see. So a lot of money, a lot of scientific effort going into carbon storage uh, options, which, you know, I'm not against carbon storage. I think in the long run, carbon storage will play a role, but I think it will be a relatively small role because the logistical and economic obstacles are giant. And meanwhile, other kinds of solutions like energy efficiency or um, grid resilience, grid integration, uh, demand response pricing, many things that we know could work and could work today, technologies that already exist that don't need you know, some kind of breakthrough. Um, relatively less money is going into those kinds of solutions because the fossil fuel industry isn't interested in those solutions. Now, we, we, we do a lot of hitting at the fossil fuel industry, and I, th I think rightly so over this situation. 
Is there a, a larger problem, though, of one that's just, and of course, you, you've, you've written a sci-fi book about the fall of Western civilization, which was great. We had you on for that, and that was one of my favorite interviews we've, we've done. Um, uh, is also part of the problem here, though, that civilization in of itself is so dependent on fossil fuels? I mean, if all of a sudden we didn't have access to energy, a lot of people would be very angry. Well, you just made a, a segue that the fossil fuel industry loves, which is the segue from fossil fuels to energy. The reality is, of course, we need energy. Our whole civilization, as we know it, has been based on tapping the energy in fossil fuels, coal first and then oil and gas. But there are other forms of energy that are less damaging, that are less deadly. And those forms of energy exist. And it's renewable energy. Uh, solar and wind is now cheaper. They're now cheaper than fossil fuels in most places. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, wind and solar are the cheapest form of newly installed electrical power. So the economic excuses of the past, that renewable is just too expensive, those excuses have gone away. And the fossil fuel industry also likes to talk a lot about intermittency. They want us to think that renewables can't really do the job because they're too intermittent, but that's not true either. We have many good studies that show that actually we can meet probably 80% of our power needs here in the United States with renewable energy if we upgrade and integrate the electricity grid so that the power can be moved to where it's needed. Because it is true, the wind doesn't always blow uh, in any one place, but somewhere in America, the wind is blowing and the sun is shining pretty much all the time. And so if you could integrate and upgrade the electricity grid uh, and move the power more efficiently, say from Oklahoma to Chicago or, you know, Arizona to California, we could meet our energy needs. But again, the fossil fuel industry doesn't want you to know that. They want you to think that the only reliable energy is fossil fuel energy. And that's just not true. So 80% of our energy needs could be met right now if we had the system in place uh, for the entire country. With, with Yeah, I mean, energy. experts will argue about the details. You could get someone on who would tell you it's only 70%. You could get Mark Jacobson from Stanford. He'd tell you it's 100 But I think based on my reading of the literature, 80 is a pretty good estimate. And if we were to do that, that would go a huge way towards solving this problem and you know, bringing the damaging interference in the climate system uh, to, an, to, to a halt. And, and as you said, we, we don't know the details and we don't know what's going to be in the Build Back Better Act. If we're going to get a Build Back Better Act at all at this point, it's also unclear. But did you see, did, do, you, do, you, do you see that some of that trans, uh, transformation of our energy system would be in that measure of what has been talked about? Well, you know, I'm a historian. I try not to follow the sort of play-by-play -play in D.C. because it gives me a stomach ache. And so I, I try to stand back from those details and try to understand the larger forces behind what's happening. And I think we've certainly seen in the last few months how the continued power of the fossil fuel industry is probably the single biggest obstacle to our adopting the technologies that already exist. Because, you know, who ever even heard of Joe Manchin a year ago, right? Now he's like the most famous member of Congress. Why? Because he, who's closely connected to coal interests and who I, I believe has an ownership interest in, yes, he does. in coal sure. companies, yes, yeah, um, is blocking uh, strong action, or at least this is what we're reading in the newspaper. And it's not the first time. I mean, it's not like Democrats have always been, you know, all good on this issue. When, when the United States voted, when the Congress voted not to participate in the agreement back in 1997, uh, there was a resolution passed in Congress, the so-called Byrd-Hagel Amendment, which many people have forgotten, but Robert Byrd was the senator from West Virginia. So the Democrat defense of coal interests is a long, deep one, and, and the Democrats have had a really hard time shaking it. Yeah, and think about the relationship also to the, to the coal unions, the coal worker unions uh, as well. Yeah, and that's just frankly cowardice because the reality is the number of people working in coal mines in this country is actually very, very small. Renewable energy is one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. There are far more jobs now in renewable energy and efficiency than there are in coal. It would be it would take very modest adjustments to make those coal miners whole, uh, you know, through some kind of phased retirement or, or educational opportunities. There are a lot of things that could be done to help coal miners. Uh, it doesn't take, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what we could do to help these people. And absolutely, we need to attend to our people. Uh, but 
it's not as if coal mining has ever been a good job anyway. I mean, anyone who's feeling <laughs> sentimental about coal mining should, you know, read Zola's great novel, uh, Germinal. You, know, you read that book and you think it's unbelievable that human beings were ever even subjected to this and animals too. I mean, Zola's description of horses in coal mines is one of the most heartbreaking description of the abuse of animals that I've ever read. So yeah, if people haven't read Germinal by the great French writer, Emile Zola, um, read that and then think again about coal. I, I thought that, you know, West Virginia is not that big of a state. Uh, if you were just to guarantee, uh, you know, some kind of an income uh, for coal workers who would lose their jobs because of this transformation, if they lost their jobs because of this transformation, uh, it really is, it probably wouldn't be the biggest part of the, the spending in this bill anyways. And, no, and probably- it'd be tiny. And it would be especially tiny if you compare it to, say, the damages that we're now seeing from extreme weather events. So NOAA has put out uh, estimates of damages from extreme weather events just in 2020 alone, events that we know have been made worse by climate change, like the terrible uh, fires in California, for example. And it's billions and billions of dollars. So, I mean, the cost of helping coal miners who lose their jobs because of the phase out of coal pales into insignificance compared to the damages that we are seeing from climate change. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Naomi Oreskes. Naomi Oreskes is a historian of science at Harvard University. She's the author of a number of books. Her latest book is called Science on a Mission, American Oceanography from the Cold War to Climate Change. Let's talk more about your book, Science on a Mission. Uh, I, I did not not realize that we never really had serious scientific uh, studies. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised about this, but uh, about the oceans themselves until World War II. Right. Oceanography is a really interesting science to study because it's been around for a long time. Scientists have been curious about the ocean forever, you know, going back to the ancient Greeks and Romans. Uh, and scientists have wanted to understand the ocean and in the 19th century often came up with rather ingenious mechanisms to try to gather data about the deep sea. But it was always extremely difficult because it's very, very expensive to go to sea. And because until the 20th century, we didn't really have the scientific technologies to enable us to access the deep ocean. But that really changed around the 1930s and the period right up to the run up to World War II um, as the advent of submarines made the U.S. military and other militaries around the globe become much more interested in the ocean and particularly the deep ocean and to see the deep ocean as a potential theater of warfare. Previously, warfare had always been on the surface, so navies had been interested in things like winds and currents and tides, but had not been very interested in anything sort of below that surface later where the ships were sailing. But starting in the 1930s, the U.S. Navy became very interested in it and began to fund oceanography in a very substantive way. And the result of that was that a science that hardly even existed in America, I mean, before the 1930s, there were really only two institutions in the United States that even aspired to do oceanographic work. And most of them didn't. And those two didn't actually do it. They talked about it. They wanted to do it, but they didn't really have the means to do it. And that changed. And it changed because of the U.S. military's interest in the deep sea. And so that ends up gearing towards what they will study and what they investigated. Exactly. So the point of the book is to look at that and to say, so what difference did it make that it was the Navy rather than some other patron that became the main supporter of oceanographic work in the United States? And so it's an opportunity to look at the effect of science because we have this very clear shift of a small, poorly funded science in the 1920s where scientists want to do work. They have ideas for work they want to do. They know what questions they'd like to answer, but they don't have the means to do it. And then pretty suddenly they do have the means. And so the book looks at, well, so what happens? And the short version of it is that the U.S. Navy is very, very interested in physical questions about the deep sea that could influence the travel of submarines, that could influence submarine communication, blocking it or making it possible. And that also could influence when we get to the 1950s, the idea of launching nuclear missiles from submarines. And so that means that there's a really great willingness to fund research involving the physical properties of the ocean, and to some extent, the chemical properties as well, insofar as those chemical properties can influence the physical properties, things like temperature, density, and salinity. And so we see an enormous influx of funding into physical oceanography, what sometimes these folks that I studied called uh, military defense oceanography, 
And so as a result of that, we learned a lot about the ocean. We know much more about deep ocean circulation today than we did 50 or 100 years ago. We know a lot about the structure of the ocean floor. And we even know something about the life on the ocean floor that was discovered sort of inadvertently as part of the process of, of studying the deep sea. But the military wasn't very interested in the ocean as an abode of life. And so what I argue in the book is that oceanographers began to develop a vision of the ocean essentially as a physical medium. One oceanographer said to me, yeah, we thought about the ocean as an environment in which men and machines would travel. And that's not wrong, but it's also not the whole story because the ocean is also a hugely important abode of life. And so many questions about the life in the ocean were, I don't want to say they were ignored completely. There were certainly people who worked on it, but they didn't get the same kind of attention, the same kind of alacrity as the physical questions. And so at the end of the book, I argue that this has had serious consequences and that the destruction of marine ecosystems, the destruction of fisheries, uh, you know, there have been many, many reports in recent years about the massive damage that has been done to marine life, uh, that some of the explanation for that is that we weren't actually paying attention to these questions of life because scientists were so busy worrying about the physical properties of the ocean. What, what was causing the great destruction to ecosystems? Within, can we say ecosystems within the ocean? Well, a, a couple of things. Um, overfishing is the biggest one. So mass, the growth of massive industrialized fishing after World War II, particularly trawling, deep sea trawling, where people would sort of scour the seafloor. Uh, that's a major cause of damage and destruction of marine life. Um, also, other forms of, quote, fishing like whaling, right? Massive destructions of whales due to commercial exploitation of whales as a commodity, as a commercial property. Uh, rather than as a life form to be honored and respected and kind of admired. I mean, whales are pretty darn amazing. Um, and then pollution, massive amount of dumping of pollution into the ocean with not that much regard to what its effect on marine life could be. Um, we now, a lot of people have heard about the plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean, huge amounts of plastic that have now accumulated in the ocean that are damaging um, marine bird life. They, they, you know, they eat some of this plastic, they think it's food, and then they choke and die. So the combination of overuse of marine resources and treating the ocean as a kind of dumping ground uh, for physical garbage, radioactive waste, chemical waste, uh, all of these things have contributed to the destruction and damage of marine ecosystems. Very important connection to climate change as well and the release of greenhouse gases, and that is the acidity of the ocean is changing. Exactly. So one of the other things I talk about in the book and one of the concrete examples of the way funding really affected what people did and didn't study is the climate change issue. So we know that oceanographers were actually some of the first scientists to really raise an alarm about climate change. One of the most famous scientists to be involved in climate change in the 1950s was Roger Revelle, who was also the professor um, to Al Gore. And in the 1950s, Ravel, who was a chemical oceanographer, the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California, um, he said, you know, we really should be paying attention to this climate change issue because when we burn fossil fuels, it produces carbon dioxide. And some part of that carbon dioxide is going to be dissolved in the oceans. And so as oceanographers, this is actually a question that's central to what we do. And so Ravel was largely responsible for helping to get the funding for his colleague, Charles David Keeling, to begin measuring carbon dioxide in the ocean. Uh, that's a graph many people have seen, the so-called Keeling curve, the famous graph that shows CO2 going up and up and up. That work was started in 1958 at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So oceanographies, oceanographers were really, really well posed to really be leaders in the study of climate change and particularly to understand the way in which the dissolution of CO2 in the ocean was both a good thing because it slowed the warming of the planet, but a bad thing because it could make the oceans more acidic and that could affect marine life. But if you look at the history, actually oceanographers didn't really get very involved in climate change until much later, not until the 1980s. So why was that? Well, it turns out there were a group of oceanographers who said, we really sh should be doing this. We should try to get money so we could do this. And in fact, they even say it would be a good thing because the Navy is not really interested in climate change. So it'd be an opportunity for us to diversify our funding sources and diversify the kinds of things we study. So here's a scientist basically making 
my argument. <laughs> I, mean, I always try to find places where you know, I like as much as possible to let the scientists speak for themselves. So this scientist in 1963, his name was William von Arx, basically makes this argument and he cannot find anyone who's willing to fund a major research effort in climate and oceanography. And so they don't do it. And it's not till the late 70s that people at Scripps begin to say, hey, you know, this climate thing seems like it's going to be important. Maybe we should really look at that. And it's not really until the late 80s and into the 90s that they get the money um, to begin to work on it seriously. And one of the arguments I make in the book, and it, this is the final chapter of the book, so oceanographers at Scripps propose a big program to study the effect of climate on the oceans in the 1990s. Um, some of your listeners may remember it was called ATOC, and it became a very public thing at the time. There was a lot of public scrutiny and articles in the Los Angeles Times and other newspapers around California because the proposed experiment had the potential to harm marine life. And the proposal was stopped because of the potential to do damage. And so this raises really two questions. First of all, what I just said earlier about viewing the ocean as a physical medium but not really thinking much about the life in it. So these physical oceanographers who were very, very smart people propose a proposal to prove the reality of climate change without really thinking about the life in the ocean. And so they end up, it ends up being, frankly, if I can say a big screw up, um, they end up being sued. The project is stopped. One person dies trying to remove the equipment. Um, it's a big, terrible mess. And a lot of money and effort and a person's life were, were lost because they didn't actually think through the fact that there was all this life in the ocean. And I think that's really, really telling. It tells us that because the problem was framed in a certain way, there were all kinds of other things that they just didn't even think about. And then the other thing, of course, and this came up, one of the things I did for this book was to read the public commentary. Um, there were hearings held in California about the ATOC project in the 1990s. So I went back and read the public commentary and one of the really interesting things in the public commentary was how much people, ordinary Californians, actually knew about climate change already by 1995, 96. Um, and many people wrote, well, we don't need this experiment. We already know there's climate change. And that was a very important moment for me because I was doing this work around the year 2002, 2003. And I remember sitting in the archives in San Diego and thinking to myself, is that right? Do we already know about climate change in 1995? And so when I started digging, I realized, oh, these people were right. We did. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change had been signed in 1992. So actually, we did already know. So these oceanographers were coming in, you know, kind of like white knights. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to prove that climate change is real. But actually, a lot of their colleagues in other branches of science had already said that it was real. What happens to the ocean if we don't get control of the amount of greenhouse gases we emit of carbon into the atmosphere that's being absorbed by the ocean? Well, I think we know already uh, two really serious things are happening. So one is that the ocean is already warming and the effects of that warming are now being seen, particularly in areas where uh, hurricanes are generated. So in areas say, such as the Gulf of Mexico, the surface, mean surface temperature has increased so much now that it is driving stronger hurricanes, hurricanes that do more damage, kill more people, cost us more money to clean up. We also know that the hurricane season is lengthened. There's an official hurricane season, but we now have had hurricanes both before and after the start of the hurricane season. So we're getting more hurricanes, a longer hurricane season, and at least some of those hurricanes are worse than they would already otherwise have been. A second thing is that the change in the temperature distribution of the ocean is affecting marine life. And this affects the economies of communities that depend on it. For example, oyster fisher people, fishers, fisher people uh, in the Pacific Northwest or lobster fishers in the Gulf of Maine. We've seen very significant changes in the temperature profiles of the Gulf of Maine, which are changing the distribution of species which then affect the fishing communities that depend on those. So very specific, clear impacts on fishing communities here in the United States and, of course, all around the globe. Uh, there are around 2 billion people on this planet that depend on fish as their primary source of protein, and some of those communities are already finding it more difficult to find and fish the fish that they um, have depended on for their sustenance. And then the third issue is ocean acidification. 
Um, and this is the one that's frankly kind of terrifying. You know, the climate change deniers love to accuse me and climate scientists of being alarmists. And my response to, to that is to say, it is rational to be alarmed about things that are alarming. If your house is on fire, you would pull the fire alarm and it would be irrational not to. So here's what I think is most alarming. So ocean acidification refers to the dissolution of carbon dioxide into ocean water. It's like the, a carbonated beverage, like the CO2 in a can of Coke. When you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, more carbon dioxide can be dissolved um, into the ocean. That CO2 makes the ocean more acidic. It lowers the pH. Now, plankton, which represent the base of the food chain, many plankton species have little tiny shells. They're these little microscopic things. They have these tiny, tiny shells that are made up predominantly of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate dissolves in acid. So that means that if the ocean becomes more acidic, some of these calcareous plankton will be affected and almost certainly not for the better. So this is the base of the food chain. This means that human activities, burning fossil fuels, are altering and damaging the base of the food chain. And that, I think, is pretty darn alarming. Could that cause just a complete extinction within the ocean? Or, or am I well, I don't know. If, I don't think most scientists would think it would be a complete extinction, but I think we could see very, very major disruptions to ocean food chains, which could certainly, uh, in the fullness of time, lead to extinctions of many species and huge disruptions uh, of marine life. Obviously, a disruption of marine life affects us because so many people rely on seafood as a way of life uh, and other resources like that. Is there is there anything else, though, if, if, if there were, theoretically speaking, an extinction of life in the ocean, does that in other ways affect what happens on land? I mean, I think for many people, we, we, we see these are just two different realms that don't really affect one another. And of course, obviously, if, if you rely on fish as, you know, if you're a fisherman or whatever it may be, that's a big deal. But outside of that, is are there other effects that people may not realize? Well, I think the main thing is the way in which biological effects ramify into social and cultural effects. So it is true that many Americans don't eat a lot of fish and my, many Americans might think, I don't like fish anyway. But... Two billion people around the globe depend on fish as their primary source of protein. And many of these people are not wealthy people. So if a major source of food supply were to be cut off to large numbers of people around the globe, this is potentially very socially destabilizing. And this was essentially the theme of my sci-fi, you know, speculative novella, Collapse of Western Civilization, that it's not just about the physical collapses, but that these things ramify. So one of the things we know is that food shortages can lead to food riots. They lead to the price of food going up. Food riots can destabilize governments. Destabilizing governments can lead to mass migrations. Mass migrations can lead to civil war, and that can spill over. And we saw this in Europe, you know, with the, um, the Syrian crisis, right? Dislocation in Syria which wasn't necessarily caused by climate change. There were many social reasons for the problems there, but they were almost certainly made worse by the droughts that were made worse by climate change. So then they ramify and then you get massive dislocation, uh, immigrant crisis, these immigrants come to Europe. We had those terrible pictures of, you know, Hungarian, Hungary, you know, putting up fences to prevent immigrants from coming in. Um, and, and this then, I think this is fair to say, led to strengthening the resurgence of right-wing politics in Eastern Europe because it's a sense that um, these were foreigners, these were people we don't want in our country. And that taps into a lot of very old, very well-established and very ugly trends in European history. And I think that recent events have shown in the United States that we can't assume that we wouldn't be succumb to similar kinds of problems here in this country. So I guess the argument is that, you know, it's not just about the fish. It's what those fish mean for people and how those effects on people ramify throughout the globe. The other thing, of course, is that even if you don't eat fish, you eat a lot of products that are made with fish or marine products. Lots of our food products have algae in them. They have seaweed. Uh, they have thickeners derived from seaweed. So if we were to see major losses in marine life, we could expect the price of food in the United States to go up, even if we ourselves are not personally eating fish.
Finally, something that always stuck with me in our last interview a number of years ago concerning the collapse of Western civilization was, and this is a story you tell, sci-fi story you tell a couple hundred years in the future, and historians looking back to see what happened during this period of time. The only nation that really survived and still existed was China. And it was sort of this idea of democracy sometimes, or oftentimes, I think we're witnessing it now, are usually uh, get down, way down into factional fighting incapable of dealing with something that needs to be dealt with immediately. And you theorize the only nation that would actually make it through this would be one that was more authoritarian like China. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was wrongly accused by some people of defending, you know, authoritarianism when in fact the whole point of the book is the opposite. It's to say, if we start to face really major crises, especially things like food shortages, food riots, or even just escalating costs of food, these are potentially very politically destabilizing and I think we have seen in recent years that democracy is a lot more fragile than many of us have assumed. Um, and that when things go bad, demagogues take advantage of that. They exploit people's fear. I mean, we know this from history, right? I mean, if you think about World War II, um, I've just been reading a fascinating book. You might want to invite the author. It's a book called Fascist Pigs, and it's about pigs and the raising of pigs in fascist Europe. Um, and one of the points that this author makes, and, and many other historians have said this as well, I mean, why did the Nazis rise to power in Germany, which at the time was one of the most sophisticated, one of the most culturally developed, and the most scientifically advanced country in the world, succumbs to Nazism? Well, one thing we know is that um, during and after World War I, there were tremendous food shortages. Lots of people in Germany went hungry. And that hunger made people afraid and angry. And when people are afraid, um, they do a lot of bad things. And so I think we have to be really worried about the way in which unfolding climate change will open up opportunities for dictators, demagogues, and other right wing. Or I mean, there could be demagogues on the left as well, but usually the pattern we've seen at least in the 20th century was demagogues of the right, um, using that, exploiting that, and saying, we can't afford the niceties of democracy. We have to take charge. We have to control this. And also, as I suggested in the novella, that non-democratic countries will be more able to mobilize quickly to address the problems. And so that will also serve to kind of undermine people's confidence and faith in democracy. Am I saying that this will definitely happen? No, of course not. I hope it doesn't happen. My books are meant to be warnings. They're meant to make people sit up and pay attention so that these bad things don't happen because we do have the power to stop them. We're not helpless. Um, History is not a runaway train. But if we don't pay attention, if we don't know what's going on, then we can't think through what we need to do to address it. Naomi Oreskes is a historian of science at Harvard University, and she is the author of the book Science on a Mission, American Oceanography from the Cold War to Climate Change. Professor Oreskes, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Likewise, thank you.